we have the we have pleasure, pleasure uh, to uh, have John, John Ingram, Ingram visiting C4. C4. And John, and John uh, is the head uh, of the Food Systems Program at the Environmental, environmental Change Institute at Oxford, Oxford uh, University. University. And uh, as the director of FTA, the CGR program on forestry and agroforestry, we couldn't uh, miss this opportunity. This event is meant to uh, address the global picture and the research which we are conducting and aim to conduct in FTA. We need better, more sustainable food systems. Uh, and, and within, within that, that, what roles can forests, forest, uh, trees, trees and agroforestry and play, play, and what are the research perspectives? So, so, to help us progress on this issue and lay the ground for discussion, discussion today we will have a, a, a keynote, keynote speech uh, by John Ingram, Ingram, and then three, three shorter presentations uh, by uh, Terry Sunderland, uh, who will show how forests and trees contribute to food security and nutrition. As you remember, Tony Sunderland was a former C4 scientist scientist and uh, he has been team leader of the high level panel of experts report on sustainable forestry for food security and nutrition which was a landmark report because it was the first time that uh, forest uh, uh, forestry issues were discussed in the committee on world food security of uh, the united nations and then two scientists from FTA, uh, one from C4 and one from ECRAF, will present their perspectives. Uh, Amy Ikovis is the leader of the Sustainable Landscapes and Food Research in C4, and Stefan McMullin uh, is uh, from ECRAF, where she leads the research on the contribution of agroforestry to, to nutrition. And at the end, uh, I will ask uh, Ramni Jamnadas, uh, who is connected with us uh, in Nairobi, uh, to, to wrap up uh, the, the seminar. Uh, so, John, the floor, the floor is yours. Good, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for um, staying with it. The um, enhancing food system resilience is what we're going to be talking about. But I'm going to start by just repeating the uh, notion, notion of what, of what the, food the food system, system is, is, because is without understanding, understanding that, you can't really talk about the resilience of it. Of it. First, First up, we have, we have this wide, wide range of activities, activities that we uh, are all aware, aware of, the, um, the notion of producing food, food through processing, processing wholesale, wholesale retail, retail consuming, consuming, of course, and, and, and the hospitality, uh, all of which have a wide range of activities. As we go from left to right in the diagram, we see a transformation of material, from what, what is essentially a biomass into what is essentially food. food. And, that's and that's an important that's point, point to remember. To remember. We, also we also see the opportunity, the opportunity for value addition as we go through that, that process. process. And we and see, we see um, the, 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 the cost of the food increasing, the cost as we go from left to right. We see a wide range of livelihoods and actors involved, all of whom are benefiting from that process. So, 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 in addition, in addition to, the to the activities, we also think, think about the food, food system outcomes, outcomes. And, and, of course, food security, food security is writ large, large utilization, utilization, access and availability, and availability all of which need to be stable, stable over time. time. But, the but the food, food system, system activities, activities themselves also, also give rise to a wide range of other outcomes to do with social and economic well-being, well social capital, capital employment, employment, health, etc. Et and there is a direct feedback to the, to the activities. activities. But, the but the activities, activities also, also give rise to a wide range of environmental, environmental issues, issues, and here we yeah, see some of the points, points that we'll be looking at later this afternoon. afternoon. Again, Again, there are, there are feedbacks. feedbacks. And, what and what we're, we're trying, trying to establish, to establish with this conceptual model, model is how to, how to, how to manage, manage the trade-offs trade between the box on the left and the box on the right by exploiting potential synergies with our interventions. So that, if you will, is the goal. Overall, Overall, the global, global food situation, situation global, global food security, security situation, situation, we've got about a billion people who, who don't have enough uh, calorie, calorie they're, they're hungry. hungry. We've got we've perhaps got um, three billion, billion people with insufficient nutrients. nutrients. We've got, we've got um, something, something like, like two and, two and, 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 half, and a half billion of us with, with, with too much, much many of many whom of also have insufficient have nutrients, nutrients, and you can see the overlap in the circles. But even with the overlap, we still, still recognize we've got, got this notion of triple, triple burden, burden of malnutrition. And, and this, this really, really just leaves, leaves under half, half the global, global population, population with, with a, a satisfactory, satisfactory diet. diet. We, also we also know about, about the, state the state of the environment. environment. The reports the come out on an almost on daily, daily basis. basis. Soil, Soil degradation, degradation freshwater fresh exploitation, exploitation, biodiversity all loss, loss, all of which have a significant um, driver in our, in our food systems. systems. The food, food uh, from, the, from the ocean, um, overfished, overfished, fully fished, 
and of course there's a massive greenhouse gas emission from the food system. So um, three quarters or so from agriculture and perhaps a quarter from what's called the post-farm gate. But then, in addition, we've got other issues, and the notion of plastics is top of the list at the moment, both macro and micro plastics, but general pollution is a major issue. In addition, we've got a whole range of other issues to do with our, our health in relation to the interaction with animals. Um, here we see a diagram showing our livestock, our wildlife, and our human population and the various diseases that emerge in these intersections, very largely driven by increased um, antibiotic use in the livestock sector, leading to uh, uh, antimicrobial resistance, and just generally more interaction between animals and humans as more and more people get urbanized. Um, then we have a whole host of ethical concerns. Now these are a list, this is a list and you can add your own issues. They are much more related to a personal world view and what you think is important. Um, you run your eye down the list and you can see it ends in such major issues as civil harmony. And I just used this slide you might have seen before, which was a, an analysis um, mapped onto the uh, food price spikes of 2008, 2011, showing where there were food riots and very largely um, attributed to what's been termed the, the Arab Spring. The, food, the world food price goes up and down all the time. This graph is the latest I could find from the 2018 up to December. And you can see how the, the, the global food price index ranges considerably over time. Right now we're on the red curve and we're going down to uh, not the very lowest, but below average. The question is what's going to happen in the future? Or as I put it, what's coming down the track? And immediately we think of extreme weather events. Uh, we're well aware of the issues. Um, again, on a daily basis in our news feeds, we see droughts, we see major storms, we see floods, we see hurricanes. Attribution is difficult. What is a particular event related to climate change? P very hard to say, but increasing science in that area. But what is very clear, as you see on the, the right of the diagram, is that as one changes both the mean and the variance of weather events, one tends to have more e extreme hot. We do, not lose the, we do not lose the extreme cold, as we've just seen in North America. In addition to weather and climate, uh, there's a big biodiversity discussion going on. On the left, we see projected global forest area up to the year 2030, and the graphs are all sloping down. On the right, we see a recent analysis by Georgina Mace and other colleagues, which is looking at the biodiversity index against much the same time. Uh, the, the curve is almost identical to the forest loss and as you look to the various options for better biodiversity management, there is a red line steeply going down even, even more steeply. So the management of forest, the management of biodiversity is a major issue as we go over the next few decades. Also over the next few decades, we see a marked increase in population. Um, the red is the urban population and the blue is the uh, rural population. The major areas of growth are in Asia and Africa, and over the, the, the decade 2010, 2030, 2050, we see a very rapid increase in populations in these parts of the world, and an increasing proportion in the urban environment. Hand in hand with the increase in population is increased in projected wealth. And the Eat Lancet report uh, suggests there might be a threefold increase in, in wealth over the next few decades. This graph here on the left from Goldman Sachs shows that we have an overall increase in the world middle class, which is defined as between $6,000 and $30,000 a year. And there's going to be another 2 billion middle class people um, on the planet within a couple of decades, which is generally a good thing. The question is, um, and we see on the right um, how they're spread across uh, different regions where the strongest growth in middle class will be in the Asia Pacific region where we're, where we're speaking from today. Um, 
hand in hand with that is 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 a well established uh, relationship between the uh, the calorific uh, intake per day on the the uh, on the y axis and the uh, disposable income on the on the x axis and this is a very clear graph coming from Dave Tillman and, and Mike Clark a few years ago in Nature. Um, Indonesia is this uh, green, uh, is part, part of the green track here. And I think you'll agree that that's a very clear relationship. As we go through time, as we look across economic groups, we tend to eat more as we get wealthier. So there are emerging trends. Here we have um, just a headline from a few years ago now about obesity in the United States, and the United States is often held up, or, or has been held up as you know where it's all at. Um, this was making the point that there's been an increase um, recently, uh, which is bucking the trend down. Um, but of course, it's not only uh, an issue in North America. Here's some data from here in Indonesia, which is showing how the um, overweight and obese uh, population um, is about one in three adults now in this country. And there's over uh, 10 million uh, type 2 diabetic patients in this country already who are actually registered. There are probably more who have yet to be registered. And this is still very much in the, in the press, and this was from uh, last Sunday from the Jakarta Post. Obesity continues to haunt Indonesia despite the campaign. It's really difficult, really difficult to change our pattern of consumption. If one thinks about the future, um, this is just a, a quick um, sketch, which isn't to scale, but it's to make a point that we have a graph of calorie consumption per day on the y-axis and billions of people on the x-axis. Um, the green line is 2,000 calories a day, which is just a little bit less than the, 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 national, uh, the global average now. And the gray line is for the year 2000, showing that when there were about 6 billion people, we had over, over a billion people hungry. We had about 1.5 billion people above the line with too much. Uh, the majority were about the right amount of calorie. This is just calorie. It's not overall nutrient. Here we are today. We've got about 7.3, 7.4 billion people. We see the stats I was giving earlier. We've still got about a billion people who don't have enough. And we have 2.5 billion of us with too much. Um, if we take this forward, looking at the Goldman Sachs, looking at the, the, um, the, 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 the Clark and uh, Thilman and Clark paper, and we just linearly extrapolate over the next 10, 10 years when we have that degree of increased wealth, we see a global population of eight point something. We still see about a billion people hungry, and the latest FAO data is showing that that number is actually increasing over the last two years. And we see um, maybe uh, getting on for four billion people with too much. And if we linearly extrapolate that again, we see the um, global population of about nine billion, nine and a half billion, and the extrapolation, uh, the reports from uh, Goldman Sachs saying over half the global population will be um, excess weight. So what's the consequence of this? This is, this is not necessarily going to happen. They're just linear extrapolations. But if this were to happen, we see a massive environmental consequence of providing that number of calories. The area beneath the curve is the amount of calorie that has to be produced. So here we are on the black line, this amount of calorie. On the red line, this amount of calorie. And you earlier saw the environmental data on our current methods. The current cost of the triple burden of malnutrition is in the order of 10 or 11 percent of global GDP. This is not only treatment of disease, but lost working days and the like. And the current cost of the uh, nearly half billion um, diabetics is in the order of um, getting on to a trillion dollars a year. So these are, these are massive numbers, but these are numbers today. And the point I'm trying to make is, unless we reverse that trend that I have on the graph, these numbers are going to be even greater. What we need to do, however, is continue to strive to meet demand for those who don't have enough. Fundamental. But to my mind, the bigger challenge is how to meet demand of those who have too much. And this is to do with the societal trend, 
that we are seeing in the uh, in the data. Managing demand is, is the agenda that I think is uh, very important at the moment. We must not forget we need to continue to meet demand. Managing demand. So these food system challenges are interconnected. What we're trying to achieve food security for a, for a growing, wealthier, urbanizing population. But that in itself is hard enough, but it's against this background of other stresses and shocks. And this is where I'm going to start beginning to talk about the need for resilience. Food system resilience, many definitions, but this is one from ETH Zurich. Uh, capacity over time for a food system to deliver basically what we want in the terms of food. However, this only relates to food security. And we must remember all the other things we want out of the food system. We want the livelihoods, we want the health, we want the, the good environment. So one needs to think of enhanced understanding to actually bring in this wide range, this basket of things we want of our food system. And it is indeed a very value-laden debate and we need more evidence, we need more research to get some better understanding of how we can manage these uh, shocks and stresses. So when we're talking about resilience, two questions immediately come to mind, and these are, these are well known. Resilience of what to what? What are we talking about? There's another question though, for whom? Whose resilience? And there's another question, over what time period? because you can have different strategies to handle different lengths of time. So of what food system activities? Yes, of course, these activities need to be resilient, but I argue that it's the outcomes that need to be resilient. We need to have food security. We need to have good health and wealth and employment. We need to have good environment. These are the things that we need. The two what? The notion of, um, of, shock, of steam trains or black swans, this is some work from Jim Woodhill and others of my colleagues and Foresight for Food program, where the steam trains are, are, are things we know are happening. We can see that the engine coming down the track at us, we know it is just getting bigger and bigger. Whereas the black swans are these very rare and unpredictable events and the, the reality is we have a combination of the two. And some examples of the stresses or the steam trains on the left the demographic change, climate change, urbanization, whereas on the right, we have these shocks. We have uh, trade wars, we have food scares, we have extreme weather. And then across the piece, we have science and technology that can be both stress and shock, uh, geopolitics, etc. So to differentiate stress and shock is important. Um, for whom? Well, everybody in the room. We are all part of the food system, we're all consumers, but of course for all these livelihoods, all of these actors across the food chain, it's fundamental that their, that their livelihood strategy is maintained as best as possible. And then to differentiate short-term interruptions, usually due to shocks, for instance, a just-in-time grocery delivery being disrupted by an IT malfunction, something like that, that's a shock. And the industry colleagues refer to these as interruptions, and they differentiate from disruptions, which are normally due to stresses. And both of these um, stresses or shocks require different types of management to deal with, as we'll see. So coming on to the notions of resilience, there is, there's a very widely understood interpretation of the word, which means robust. I am resilient because I'm strong. I can withstand the shock and the stress aim to dis, uh, resist disruption to our current outcome, to our current food system. Um, recovery, where we aim to return to the current outcome after that disturbance. So we have the ability to get back to what we know and like. And the third type I call reorientation, which is that we actually accept an alternative outcome. We accept an alternative future. We don't try to go back to what we have we accept, and that's what I call bounce forward as opposed to bounce back, we accept a different way of living. Any and all of these require reorganization. They all require adaptation. Um, you need to adapt your system to make it robust. You need to adapt your system to reorient the outcomes. So what can we do? Reorganize the food system activities. These activities, we can do all these things differently. 
We can produce food differently, we can sell food differently, we can certainly consume food differently. But we can also organize, uh, reorganize the food system drivers, the, the conditioners which are affecting the way those activities are undertaken. Whether it's in the policy context or the social, we can look after the environment, we can think about markets. And there's a whole range of um, policy interventions to be made here. And then, of course, we can reorganize our views of what we want as outcomes. And here we see food security on the left as our principal goal. But of course, as I've mentioned, there are various other things that we want out of our food system, other societal interests. And how do we think about changing our, 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 our menu, if you will, of things we want and are happy with? And this is the trade-off, this is the synergy that we're looking for. Do we want better employment? And are we happy to sacrifice some aspect of our food system? for instance, change our diet. And then we can also think about how we reorganize the food system outcomes in terms of better farming methods, uh, changing diet, or just countries valuing food, which is nutritious rather than cheap. And this message is coming through again and again and again in a, in a wide range of publications. Another point is really to reorganize our views on the demand function. So that graph I put up that ramped up over the decades is a demand curve. And so if we look at the FAO definition, which I'm sure you recognize, it's got a word kind of hidden in there, which is sufficient. And the important word sufficient um, is, is, is well worth thinking about because what sufficient actually means is enough for a given purpose. And when this definition was drafted um, nearly 20 years ago, just over 20 years ago, the, the sentiment of that word was, for those who don't have enough, we need to provide more. But actually, it, it applies more today than it did then, because it also means for those of us with too much, we don't need so much, we should have the right amount. And this is coming through in the very recently published uh, Eat Lancet report. Um, I've made the point that we're looking for healthy diets they are from sustainable food systems. And I'm very pleased to see that reflected in the title of this, because there was often a notion we want sustainable diets. What we actually want is sustainable systems delivering healthy diets. And healthy diet outcome have all these attributes, including the word sufficient, and sustainable food system activities have to be environmentally sound, as everybody accepts, and socially acceptable, but they also have to be economically viable, because without that viability, the enterprises and the livelihoods will be at risk. And so the notion of healthy diets, sustainable food systems, is a very, very important point. So how do we intervene with this system? We have our activities giving rise to our outcomes, which are modified by a range of environments. We've seen the uh, change in socioeconomic drivers over the last 50 years or so, and these have led to measurable changes in environmental conditions, very clearly uh, mapped out in many, many ways. The important thing about the food system is not so much the impact of one of the words on the left, for instance, climate, on one of the words on the right, for instance, crop growth, which has had a huge amount of research. The interesting thing from the system point of view is the interaction of these drivers on the whole system, because the system will respond systemically, not piecemeal. And this is why one needs to think about the intervention. When one has an intervention, one can intervene with the activities, we can do things differently. We can intervene with the context, the environments, but we can't intervene with the outcomes. The outcomes are a consequence of changed activity. And a lot of people say, oh, we need to change, we need to intervene on food security. What you actually do is you intervene on the conditions and the activities that give rise or do not give rise to food security, okay? And when one makes an intervention, normally for a socioeconomic goal, more food security, more political stability, whatever it is, 
one sees the feedback because that's why you're doing it, but there is, of course, always an environmental feedback as well. And even if one has a policy to enhance environment, it will have an impact on the social, the economic uh, context. It might make food more expensive, for instance, change the affordability. So where to intervene and who does what is very important. Um, just to conclude, wh why is it so hard? Why is it so hard to make progress in this? Well, we've got a complex adaptive system. We need to understand it systemically. It's challenging, intellectually difficult, but nonetheless reality. Wide range of actors, a um, lot of vested interests, fragmented governance across the piece. So these are things to think about, also beset with confused terminology. But on the plus side, there's a whole host of things that we could do. Look at all those activities we can do differently. Look at all those environments we can change. But fundamentally, it needs better cooperation between all the actors in the piece. And this message again is coming out again, again in the Eat Lancet report as the most recent um, expose of that. And this means there are many plausible futures. It's not necessarily that graph that I showed, and goodness me, I hope it isn't. How are we going to do it? Well, here's the summary of the graph on the left, how to ramp it down. On the right, how to ramp it up. But we've got a wide range of motives and different agendas running here. On the right, where a lot of the work of the CG system is, it's how to increase for those who don't have enough. This is absolutely fundamental, important work, development agenda stuff. On the left, we've got a different set of agendas. It's the health agenda, it's the, it's the environment agenda, it's driven by agencies such as those examples I've given, and a whole host of national um, agencies, NGOs, etc., etc. But um, the important thing is that looking for this word synergy, it really should be possible to get these two agendas hand in hand. And one of the best ways to do it is to include business more overtly in this equation, because it is the agents of change, the food system actors, that we need to engage. And that means everybody on that first slide from the fertilizer industry right the way through to the people who manage agricultural and human waste. All of those actors are involved. Civil society, think of yourselves as citizens or think of yourselves as consumers. Which one do you feel is, is, the, is, you know, is, is, is the important? So the, the point about this last closing slide is that everything that's happening here in the CG is in fact helping on the left. And everything that's happening on the left is in fact in effect, helping on the right. It's just that it's got to be captured and it's got to be, it's got to be made clearer that investment should be balanced across the piece. And I do say again that I think the bigger challenge is how to ramp down the graphs on the left rather than how to ramp up the graph on the right. That's the challenge. But if we can do that, it will <coughs> definitely help on the, on the right. So I think, um, Vincent, that's where I'd like to close, if I may. I had a romp across a wide range of issues, the notion of food systems, the notion of resilience, the notion of better collaboration and cooperation amongst the actors. Thank you. If we could have Terry's presentation, that would really uh, be an excellent opening to, to the discussion. And then um, uh, I, I, I suppose we can have a, a 50 to 20 minutes uh, discussion uh, and questions to, to John and also debates amongst, uh, amongst ourselves for, for the research we, we do. There was a question I wanted to, to, to ask you. We're talking about production, uh, the food system at large, so it's production, uh, it's consumption, it's the value chain. So. Uh, if we are consumers, sometimes we find ourselves in a very restricted uh, space of choice, uh, huh. whether because we're poor and, and uh, only part of you know uh, uh, is of, yeah. of, of what's out there is accessible, 
uh, or because uh, of what is being produced where you live. I mean, if you live in the Sahel, uh, your diet is obviously very much constrained by the environment you're living in depends directly. How, depends how rich you are. Yes, but I mean, in, the, in, in some regions where uh, people are you know, nomadic mm. or, or yep. ways of lives, mm. or if you're in the middle of the forest in Kalimantan uh, and far from the city, <laughs> basically uh, your diet is constrained. So mm. uh, what is the best way to intervene on the, on the constraint system? Uh, uh, we've been talking well, a lot about I've production, we've been talking about sure. consumption, difficult value well, chains. I've, I've got, I've, I think yeah. I've got one other slide, if I, yeah. if I may. Is this still going to, just let me go down another slide. So, um, is that going to, is that going to, is that live anymore? Oh well. Um, a, a lot of our work, a lot of our work is, is very much what I call post farm gate. Now that's not the traditional work area for the CG system, but it increasingly needs to be. And it's a different type of um, study. It's important. Is it possible to get my next slide up from next this slide, yeah. set? I, I wasn't going to use it because it's a bit another sort of discussion, but it's very much about the value chain. And um, thank you, that's fine. And so here, here is our situation, our global food security situation as I, as I described it in shorthand. Um, my question is what, what determines which circle anybody falls in? And the, um, the, the, the point I make is it's, it's not the agriculture, it's your um, constraints on dietary choice. So in your example in the Sahel, there are serious biophysical constraints, but at the same time, they could be mapped in terms of affordability. So my response to you is if you're really rich in the Sahel, it doesn't matter, you just helicopter in all the food you want, as a glib exa example. But for all of us, these other words in italics actually determine what we have for dinner. And then the, the point about the value chain is that um, the, 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 the post-farm gate activities of the processing, the packaging, the trading, all of these activities, all of these livelihoods actually um, affect the affordability, the availability, the palatability, the, the cultural norms, all of that stuff. And that's absolutely fundamental. And then those people um, depend on the primary producers for the raw material, the biomass as I called it, from the farming or the fishing or whatever it is. But to imagine that the, the producers are directly affecting the top line is false. Because even in the most basic system, the most, the most fundamental system, there is food processing. And I remember a, a storybook from my childhood of a, of, a, of a kid in Ghana called Effiong who took cassava and he took it home and he grated it and he fried it into Gary and he took it to the market and he sold it for a penny. So he was, he was a food system. He was part of the food system. And he was, the, he was, he was both the, the grower and he was the, the, the pink in the middle. And the, these people, of course, depend on the natural resource base, the productivity, or the diversity and the quality of that natural resource base in order to deliver the biomass at a, at, a, at, a, at a quantity and quality, which can then go into the pink box. And there's very little stuff that we eat which does not go through the pink box. Basically, you need to have your own apple tree in your own garden, and you walk to it and you go like that. Otherwise, something is happening in that pink box. And, and again, to, to make the point, that's where so many livelihoods are. The economic machine is there in the pink box, and that's where the agents of change are. It's not as simple as that, of course, there are massive feedbacks, and the whole thing is, is moderated by these environments. So here we have a different type of food system map, and it's a map to explain why we have the circles at the top. So if we want to change the proportion of numbers in the circle at the top, we need to think about the constraints on dietary choice, not what do people grow. That's a fundamental point. 
Thank, thank you, John, and, and thank you for pointing to one of the important functions of food system is not only to deliver food, but it also deliver jobs Absolutely. and income for a very, very wide range of, of the world population. So if we could have now Terry's uh, presentation. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, it's wonderful to be here and have an opportunity to share with you uh, the key findings from the HLP report on sustainable forestry on food security and nutrition. Um, I'd like to start with providing some uh, statistics uh, about the importance of forests and people and, and why forests and food security are inextricably interlinked in many ways. Um, we all know uh, through empirical evidence that more than a billion people rely on forests and forest resources in some way. They provide an important safety net in times of food and income insecurity. Um, the forest-based uh, um, resources such as wild harvested meat and fish provide enormous amounts of protein for many rural communities. And um, biodiversity, terrestrial biodiversity in particular, uh, which occur in forests, uh, provide um, great uh, amounts of primary health care, or provide for primary health care. And we also know that in complex multifunctional landscapes, um, a great deal of the world's food comes from smallholder farms um, in these complex landscapes, uh, often characterized by patches of forests and trees. There's a long tradition of managing forests for food. Um, if we think of shifting cultivation, Sweden agriculture, for example, um, and it's extremely important how to understand these, these processes and patterns uh, have changed uh, the nature of forests uh, over time, and, and particularly in, in these multifunctional landscapes that I mentioned earlier. And we also know that forests sustain agriculture through the ecosystem service provision, uh, which I'm gonna talk about a little bit later. So in the HLP report, we developed, uh, or for the, the report rather, we developed a conceptual um, uh, sort of framework to understand how and why uh, forests do play a role in food security and nutrition. Um, and they range from uh, provisioning uh, ecosystem services, so direct provisioning uh, of food and, and bioenergy and income, and, and the non-provisioning ecosystem services such as uh, pollination services, biodiversity, etc. And these are linked very closely to the four pillars of food security available access and utilization and stability and these arrows here sh very clearly show uh, although they're a little bit messy uh, do show the the relationship between each of these uh, ecosystem services um, and these four pillars so in terms of the direct provision of food, although the contribution of forest foods or wild foods uh, re uh, represent only a relatively small amount of the food energy supply, we do know that people living in proximity to forests and, and tree-based systems have uh, better diets, more nutritious diets, and experience more dietary diversity. And, and as I mentioned earlier, bushmeat, fish, insects, and other protein sources are extremely important as sources of nutrients. And you can see the scale from those figures there, uh, the scale of the, of the importance of wild meat and bushmeat uh, in the Congo Basin and Amazonia uh, uh, alone. The provision of wood fuel, uh, energy sources from forests and trees are extremely important, not only fuel wood but also charcoal, uh, which is a huge, uh, hugely traded commodity, particularly in southern Africa and elsewhere. Um, very important for cooking, but also very important for sterilizing water. Uh, and this is incredibly um, uh, important for, um, to make sure that communicable diseases are, uh, are not spread uh, and extremely uh, valuable in terms of rural health. Um, but we do know that an estimated uh, 2.5 million people, uh, particularly women and young girls, uh, are affected each year and die, uh, can die due to the effects of long-term smoke inhalation in, in enclosed uh, kitchen spaces. So a bit of a double-edged sword. In terms of income generation, uh, up to almost 1% of the global GDP um, is uh, represented by the formal forestry sector. Uh, but if we include the informal sector, for example, non-timber forest product collection and, and construction and energy sectors, um, the value of, of forestry and forest products are incredibly important. So they play an enormous role in local economies and the rural economies of much of the developing world. Uh, and that also goes for payments of environmental services worth an estimated 2.4 billion. Those figures were from 2016. Um, an incredible amount of investment in, in conserving forests and those payments going to local people and, and landowners as well. But also ecosystem services, we're very interested in, in the, the way that forests and trees support agriculture, how sustain agriculture in terms of water regulation, soil formation, biodiversity, uh, pollination and pest control and climate change. All of these services are extremely important in, in maintaining agricultural systems but provided by forests and trees.
So in terms of forest sustaining agriculture, we know that pollination of oil palm, for example, is reliant oh, in oil palm and smallholder plantations, I should uh, uh, hasten to add, um, very important to have proximity to, to forests and trees. Pest control, crops like cocoa, coffee uh, and other commodities do benefit from having proximity to, to forests and trees to make sure that uh, there are um, elements of pest control and, and uh, nutrient um, exchange between the two systems. Water regulation is extremely important. We hear about the importance of watersheds, uh, both for um, agricultural production, but also for potability of water for uh, urban centers. It's extremely important in terms of uh, ecosystem service, uh, but also climate regulation. And some excellent work being done by CIMIT in uh, Ethiopia uh, has shown that wheat yields actually increase um, closer to, to forest patches. And it's important in these, these landscapes is understanding how the, the sort of landscape configuration, how these f um, patches of forests and trees interact with each other um, can provide um, sort of the, the maximum outputs, if you like, for both sustainable forestry and agricultural production. And, and there's a lot of work now being done on, on this, this uh, interrelationship. So ways forward um, to enable conditions for sustainable forest management for food security and nutrition. Um, one of the recommendations of the report is, is to manage permanent forest land more sustainably um, and develop appropriate forest management plans, but looking also at the broader landscape, promoting an integrated landscape approach, breaking down the silos between agriculture and forestry, as they have been done in much of uh, the rural areas of the tropics that I've been speaking about, and, and undertake a sort of systems approach to forestry and agriculture in a more, a more more holistic understanding of how they interrelate and interact. And also ensure full and effective participation of relevant stakeholders in forest policies and forest management. And one of the critical um, uh, recommendations that came out of the, the, the report and the process involved was adopting a rights-based approach. If we're saying that um, forests and wild foods uh, play a very important role to rural economies, rural livelihoods, rural diets, then we need to be considerate of making sure that access to those resources is maintained. So this is a nice summary uh, of the recommendations of the HLP report. Uh, provides secure land and forest tenure and equitable access related to uh, the right to food issue. Um, recognize and integrate forest contribution to food security and nutrition in forest policies. Um, often these, uh, these, these considerations are missed out of, of the discourse on food security and nutrition. Improve the alignment of food security and nutrition policies across many sectors, including agriculture, forestry and others and increase access by small fo uh, forest and far farm holders in, in, in their organizations to access um, you know, basic government service like, uh, services like extension services, uh, insurance policies and new technologies, training and credit. Gender is very important, uh, integrating gender equality into the formula formulation and implementation of policies related to um, uh, food security and nutrition, and also strengthening the collection and timely uh, dissemination of data relevant uh, to the policy discourse. And this is actually very important. A lot of research has been generated related to the links between forestry and food security and nutrition, but uh, as yet the policy environment has yet to embrace some of the hard science and the strong evidence that's coming out of some of this discourse. Um, thank you very much for this uh, uh, time you've given me to, to give this short presentation um, and uh, I look forward to, to uh, engaging further um, as part of the webinar seminar. Thank you. Hi, I'm Stefan McMullen with World Agroforestry based in Nairobi, Kenya. Agroforestry is the practice of integrating a diversity of trees into landscapes for greater productivity and resilience. The direct benefits of agroforestry are the products it provides, such as timber, fuel, fodder, medicine, and also food. The indirect benefits are the ecosystem services supported by trees, such as watershed management, soil fertility, combating soil erosion, carbon sequestration, and greater biodiversity. It is by these benefits which agroforestry supports food systems. And today I want to give a specific example of how agroforestry can be used to diversify production for enhancing seasonal availability of more nutritious foods, addressing harvest gaps and nutrient gaps in local food systems. In many parts of the world, the consumption of nutrient dense foods such as fruits and vegetables are far below the amount recommended by the World Health Organization, of which is 400 grams per person per day. In Kenya, for example, the daily consumption of fruits is only 87 grams and as little as 50 grams in Ethiopia. There are a multitude of factors affecting fruit and vegetable consumption, including availability, affordability, 
sociocultural preferences and practices, awareness and food marketing, with the increase in urbanization having a significant effect on food choices, as convenient and highly processed fast foods are more readily available in cities at the expense of more nutritious foods. And it isn't only consumption which is lagging behind. Data shows that the production of fruits and vegetables is far below what is required to meet adequate consumption, with Eastern Asia the only region meeting and exceeding production needs of vegetables in particular. And considering the recent Eat Lancet report on healthy diets and sustainable food systems, which recommends an increase in fruit and vegetable consumption to 500 grams per person per day, there is a need for greater production. And so to address the low consumption, which can be due in part to low availability of these foods, it is necessary to look at ways in which increased and diversified production can be promoted. And so to harness the benefits of trees, World Agroforestry developed the food tree and crop portfolio approach with the intended use of selecting socioecologically suitable and nutritionally important food tree species with complementary vegetable, pulse and staple crops for production. To identify these site-specific portfolios, Several aspects are assessed, such as on-farm food production diversity, food consumption patterns, and food composition. And to further support species selection in the portfolios, World Agroforestry and partners have developed decision support tools, such as the Vegetation Map for Africa, used to find the right tree for the right place. These maps are based on natural vegetation and potential distribution. Understanding this distribution provides a good approximation of where indigenous tree species can contribute to greater ecosystem services and support food and nutrition security. The portfolios are combinations of indigenous and exotic species that can potentially provide year-round nutritious foods, addressing food harvest gaps and nutrient gaps in local food systems. For the portfolios, harvest months of prioritized food tree and crop species are mapped across the months of the year and particularly against food insecurity periods, highlighted by the red column. In addition to filling harvest gaps, the portfolio addresses certain nutrient gaps by matching the identified foods with nutrient content data. In this example, the nutrient values for vitamins A and C and minerals iron and folate are included. Food composition data plays a key role in linking landscapes to nutrition, particularly the nutrient values of indigenous and underutilized species, for which such information is often lacking. Without this information, it could mean that certain crops rich in micronutrients are overlooked in agriculture, nutrition, planning, projects and policies. To include nutrient content information in the portfolios, the mean values of recommended nutrient intake data are calculated based on FAO and WHO references, and the percentages of nutrients are calculated for each species. To simplify the nutrient content information for the portfolios, and to highlight the variation in nutritional values, food tree and crop species are scored for whether they are a high source, a source, or a present but low source for the respective nutrient. Based on our work developing these portfolios across 16 sites in three East African countries, Kenya, Uganda, and Ethiopia, we have compiled standardized and aggregated food composition data for over 80 species in an open access database to support decision making in the selection of ecologically suitable, and nutritionally valuable tree and crop species. The database serves an important function to not only provide nutritional information, but it also highlights an important gap in data availability, shown here by the gray shading. Here is an example of the nutritional value of some indigenous food tree species for which food composition data is available. The vitamin C content of African species baobab and marula is five and three times that of oranges respectively. And while amaranth leaves, a leafy vegetable, has similar vitamin C content to oranges, it contains essential levels of iron and folate, for which vitamin C is necessary in the uptake of iron from plant foods. This highlights the importance of consuming a diversity of foods to benefit from these food interactions. And this is even more relevant based on the recent Eat Lancet report, which not only recommends an increase in the amount of fruits and vegetables consumed, but also recommends the use of more plant-based foods, which can provide protein and iron in diets. Indigenous and underutilized food tree and crop species are very important in local food systems because they are often more adapted to the landscape and therefore resilient in the face of climate change. And so the mainstreaming of these foods into wider use is necessary to ensure we are harnessing the total value of these foods. 
Our projects in East Africa have increased our geographic scope for data generation to fill critical knowledge gaps on production diversity, food consumption patterns, and food composition data, and to identify priority food tree and crop species which have the potential to contribute to healthier diets in more sustainable food systems. The portfolio approach provides an entry point for linking landscapes and diets, especially as we look towards a planetary health diet and focus on the critical role that diets play in linking human health and environmental sustainability. Hi, my name is Amy Ikowitz, and I'm a scientist at the Center for International Forestry Research working on sustainable landscapes and food systems. Thanks very much for listening to my talk today as part of the FTA webinar on food systems. I'm going to be talking about local food systems and their relationships with landscapes and diets in the tropics. We heard earlier today about the global food system and some of the challenges that we're facing today. Some of these challenges are reflected in local food systems. I'm going to focus on three components of local food systems and how they interact to affect local diets. So first we have agriculture. Agriculture can take a wide range of different types of systems. At the one end of the extreme, we can think of intensive monocrop systems. Picture a row of uh, a field with just rows of wheat or rows of maize. The other end of the spectrum, we can think of uh, complex polycultural systems with many different types of crops grown, legumes and staple crops and vegetables and fruits all grown and grown in the same plot of land. Depending on type of, the type of agricultural system that people use, that's going to affect the types of foods that are available from their agricultural landscapes. Then there's also the natural environment that people often forget about. It's um, probably the most neglected uh, aspect of local food systems in terms of when people think of local food systems, they often think of the agriculture part and the market part, but sometimes leave out the natural environment. So Terry Sunderland talked today about uh, forests as an important part of local food systems and the contributions that they can make in terms of uh, providing wild foods, but also ecosystem services that forests can provide to agriculture. There are other types of natural environments that also contribute to local food systems. So you can think of people fishing in rivers or having their cows graze on grasslands, etc. But then people can also purchase foods um, that either come from their local landscapes and local markets, so some of the foods that will be available there will be from, come from relatively short distances away, but these local markets can also provide foods that come from further away, so they can also connect the global food system to global food systems. The different components of the local food system um, can all be affected by policies. And sometimes the policies that are recommended to solve some of the challenges for the, of the global food system can have unintended consequences on local food systems. So we've all heard the, the, the narrative that the world is facing a crisis, we're going to be having 9 billion people and we don't produce enough food to feed them so we have to grow more food. And one of the common uh, proposals to address this is to recommend that farmers in developing countries intensify their agricultural production systems to grow more usually staple crops in order to feed the world and this will not only provide more food for the world so solve the globe one of the global food system challenges but also help these farmers become more efficient and thereby increase their incomes and allow them to buy more food and improve their food security. Sometimes conservationists also support this idea because they say that if we intensify on, on some land that will free up other land that can now be protected in order to um, conserve biodiversity. So that's sometimes called the land sparing argument. However, these types of policies can actually have a negative impact on the dietary quality of the people living in those producing landscapes. So one potential problem is that if everybody in a landscape now, instead of growing many different crops, all focus on producing one staple crop, that's gonna reduce the agricultural diversity in that landscape. 
So there will be fewer types of foods grown in that landscape, so fewer foods available for people to consume from those landscapes. And if the areas are set aside for protection, this will also give people less access to wild foods because they can no longer go to protected areas to collect them. So that's another potential loss. On the other hand, the whole idea of the solution is that it will give people higher incomes and better access to markets. So the idea is that they can then purchase the foods that they're losing from their local landscapes in markets. So then the question becomes, what are the net effects of these changes? Foods in local markets have to come from somewhere. If they're not coming from the local landscapes, then they're going to have to be imported into these landscapes. So one obvious potential problem with this is the ecological footprint of bringing foods from far away into landscapes, just from the transportation alone. But more importantly for this talk is that often uh, nutritious foods in local markets don't come from very far away. And others are often not even available in, in, in local markets. We've done some research in C4 looking at markets in both Burkina Faso and in Indonesia, and we found in very different contexts that the majority of vegetables sold in local markets travel very few kilometers to get into those markets. We also found very little fruit available in local markets. What this means then, if these fruits and vegetables are no longer produced in these landscapes, it's likely that the markets won't be able to replace them for people. At C4, we're, we're uh, doing a study right now using data from the Indonesia Family Life Survey. And we have a panel of uh, farming households that we observe at three points in time between 2000 and 2014. And we're seeing in these households, we're seeing incomes increasing over this time period, but we're also seeing that production diversity has declined. So people are growing fewer crops. And that at the same time, their dietary diversity is declining even while their incomes are going up. Specifically, we're seeing declines in fruit, vegetable, and fish consumption. On the other hand, we're, sh we're seeing an increase in fats, meat, and processed food consumption. So this is uh, the classic example of the nutrition transition that we're seeing in many parts of the world. The dietary challenges that we heard about uh, from John Ingram earlier uh, in the webinar are being reflected in areas in Indonesia, even in relatively remote areas where we're doing um, specific projects. And we're seeing that these changes are happening almost everywhere. And these changes are happening at the same time as local landscapes are changing. But the solutions proposed for solving some of the global challenges can uh, sometimes actually have negative impacts on local diets in the producing landscapes. We need to appreciate what is working in tropical landscapes because there are things that are working well. People um, in these traditional systems often do eat lots of fruits and vegetables and legumes. So some of the things that we're losing in global diets. And we need to work with local farmers to develop locally appropriate improvements to their food systems because these food systems are not perfect and can always be improved. But we need to be careful not to try to solve some problems in one part of the global food system by making things worse elsewhere. Thanks so much for listening to my talk today. I suggest that we uh, take the, the time we, we have now, so the, la the remaining 10 to, to 15 minutes to, uh, to um, have a discussion uh, within, with, with John, with the room, with scientists in the room, uh, about uh, what, it, what all of this tells us for you know, our research questions, are we doing the right <laughs> things? <laughs> Uh, what should we um, what should we try to focus on? Oops. Uh, and, um, uh, and and I have been told that it seems that despite our technical issues with the interface, uh, the show is still running on YouTube. <laughs> so it's I don't know how many people are able to follow us uh, live currently on YouTube, but thank you for uh, for 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 that if it's if it's the case. Uh, so, 
first, uh, to, I have a set of questions that uh, some people from FTA had, you know, asked uh, before the seminar. But before I go to that list, uh, you know them. Uh, Ravi has asked some questions. Uh, Celine uh, Termot from Bioversity, etc. Um, Amy herself. Uh, maybe some other questions from the room that we can try to address, or, or points of discussions, or remarks, or, or you know, what does that tell you? Just a, a reflection on, on that last presentation. I, I didn't hear anything about climate regulation per se at the macro level. And just talking with Maini a week or two ago about what's going on here in the Congo Basin as opposed to the very well-known examples from the Amazon, um, I think there's a it's, a it's an important point to stress. And Maini, I'm, I'm kind of throwing the microphone at you to, 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 to remind me what you were saying about the importance of forest cover, extensive forest cover in mm. climate regulation as distinct to that interaction between wheat yields, however that happens mm -hmm. in, in, in Ethiopia. Could you just say a little bit to help me remember what, <coughs> what the issue is on that? Yeah, thanks, John. Um, so in l last year, we had a, a big report on forest and water under the IUFRO, Global, well, all the big organizations around forestry on that. But one of our main points that we emphasize there is that um, in much of the debate so far and almost all considerations of food production, we take rainfall as a given. And we say, well, that's the climate, and then this is what we do with the water. Well, there is more and more evidence that the amount of rain that we have on the world's lands is to a much higher degree than we previously thought, recycled terrestrial water. So where forest and trees generally evaporate more water than other vegetation, it also means they are generating more rainfall downstream. Yeah, so all the discussions we say, well, with climate change, we might get more rain, less rain, are not yet sufficiently incorporating the feedback of vegetation on that. We tend to think that forest and climate is a matter of carbon and carbon stocks, and we've, we've spent 10 years of time on reducing emissions and linking forest climate to carbon. Probably the link via the water cycle is at least as important. Yeah. Yeah. And we can call that climate regulation. We can talk, call it the hydroclimate depends directly on, on tree cover. Yeah, and I think that's a point that, that has yet to filter down to the food systems discussion, I think. Absolutely, and, and I didn't hear it in Terry's, I didn't no. hear it in, in Terry's report. No, no, not yet. Thank you. Yes, and, and perhaps Terry was a bit uh, quick on, on one of, on, on, this, on this slide, mm -hmm. because one of the thing, uh, one of the pathways by which forests and, and trees and, and landscape provide uh, you know, essential services for nutrition are perhaps the longer pathways that do not necessarily go through the food systems, but through the environment, uh, and, and which, I mean, you mentioned pollination, uh, uh, eco perhaps more local ecosystem services, but also more global ones, such as the, uh, the atmospheric water recycling, etc., that are important for bread baskets. And here there is a red, <laughs> if you see there is a red circle, <laughs> uh, it's a bit hidden, but uh, the fact that uh, deforestation in many ways is not only threatening forests, but is threatening some of the function that forests can provide for agriculture at different, and this is something that is very often overlooked and that um, Miner's uh, report have also uh, you know, addressed uh, directly through uh, the effects through the water cycle, for instance. Uh, and, and this is one of the effects that we would like to really much stress out uh, in FTA. Ramni Jamnadas is not online, unfortunately. Uh, but looking at how, and these are also some works of Amy Ikovits uh, here uh, in C4 in Indonesia, on how mm. land use change can uh, impact uh, the nutrition of people that live in the areas that, that are, uh, you know, the speed or these, uh, um, the trains, I mean, the, the land use train, uh, uh, train that you mentioned, how, how does that really impact nutrition? Well, um, and if I can bring up another question, I mean, the question is, yeah, 
the, the, the traditional FAO definition has these four things that we have here. There is another discourse that say, well, there is a fifth dimension to that, and it is the sovereignty. And, and food sovereignty should be part of food security. And the question to who is deciding on, on what we eat, etc., and bringing much more of the agency of decisions back to the consumers, back to the farmers on that front. Um, I think it is an interesting discourse, an interesting discussion, that when we say in the end, well, the solutions will have to come from changes in diet. Well, changes in diet um, don't come because the government tells you that we have to change the diet. It will have to come bottom up. And I think the, the challenge with food systems is that we, we still tend to think of it that food security, well, we need the Ministry of Agriculture that takes care of food security. We need... No, it is the bottom-up decisions of, of every farmer every, that add up to something. Eh? In Indonesia, a classical challenge for people to understand is that when rice farmers decide that they're actually better off in converting their rice fields into an oil palm field, and every, anyone says, no, but you can't do that, you can't do that. Rice farmers have to be rice farmers because that's what we need for food security of this country. Well, if these farmers make more money by selling palm oil than growing rice. Yeah, so we, we have this strong top-down planning perspective pervading everything that is about food, and we still have to learn how to deal with the, yeah, the emerging property. There's all these different agents, actors. Everyone makes their own decisions on their own accord, both on the producer side and on the consumer side. And I think that that's food sovereignty uh, discourse has come mostly from the, from the Latin American countries and from Italy. But I think it, it does add some flavor and some aspect that we need if we want to look for how it can change. Thanks. Yes, there, there are lots of, of controversies about the, this notion of, of, of food sovereignty, but the, the way you depicted it, uh, giving the choice to the population is perhaps the, the good way. Uh, if I may have a question from from and, and then I will gi give it uh, to give the questions to the floor from Javi Prabhu uh, from ICRAF C4. Uh, no, we need to say that. Uh, uh, so, uh, John, transforming the food systems, uh, lots of huge transformation at many levels needs to take place. Uh, social transformations are, are needed. Uh, what, what, what is the, how do we deal, how can we deal with the political economy uh, and, and the, the different powers around, around that system? And is there a role here for information and knowledge to, to trigger a change uh, mm. instead of uh, maintaining a status quo? Mm. From Ravi. <laughs> Thank you, Ravi. Wow. Um, first up, understand that we're dealing with the system. And um, I, uh, Miney a moment ago said, you know, it's, it's, it's not the Ministry of Agriculture. It should never be the Ministry of Agriculture. It should be Prime Minister's Office deals with food security mm -hmm. as a starting point. Mm -hmm. Because all the different facets of government impinge on all the facets of the food system. Mm -hmm. That's the top-down bit. Mm -hmm. The bottom-up bit, of course, is us. And I made the point, are we citizens or are we consumers? We're, we are both. Mm -hmm. Um, we need to think in both, with both hats. And then in between, mm -hmm. there is everything else. So on one point, you have a monocentric governance, which, CAD, which could um, and should formulate policy that is conducive to systematic bottom-up change. Mm -hmm. And that's the role of top-down, not, mm -hmm. not to have a stick, but to have a facilitation mm -hmm. to allow... The, the, the population to change in a bottom-up way. So um, there are many, many aspects to that, but I mean, that's the sort of the first cut answer. The second point is, well, what do we actually want to change and what are we prepared to accept? And my example of enhancing resilience through reorientation is, I think, the most powerful because it addresses the d resilience of the system in that we're not so demanding of the system, but it also interfaces with the sustainability agenda because we're not so demanding of the system. And that's, that I think is the way forward. So how do we, how do we 
bring about a change in mindset amongst our societies of what is good. That's, that's really the, the nub of it. And here we're talking about behavioral psychology, we're talking about behavioral economics, we're talking about political economy. And it's the motivations and the, the um, embedded objectives of all the actors that we need to address. And, and I don't know how, and if I did know how, I'd, I'd be very happy. But all I know is that the challenge is not a technical challenge, it's a social challenge, it's a political challenge, and it's an economic challenge. And fundamentally, it's a political problem. Mm -hmm. And here in this country, what little I've seen, just about to go into an election, that will spawn the next five-year plan. By September, the transition team of the new president will want a five-year plan. Wow, what on earth is it going to say? It will be a very interesting next few months for this country. If that plan embraces the notion of food systems as distinct to agriculture, I personally think it would be a step forward. Yes, th thank you. I guess uh, Rabbi would have lots <laughs> of comments to say to, to your answer, so you, we, will, we will put you in the conversation with him. And yes, multi-stakeholder platforms, we've been advocating for that as well. So maybe the government needs to have a plan, but also some flexibility to let the actors you know, figure out by themselves. Are, are there some, some questions uh, uh, further? Yes? And please introduce yourself. <laughs> My name is Joanisa, and I just graduated from University of Kent. I'm studying environmental anthropology, so I touched out a lot of uh, political ecology on that, um, about like power, struggle regarding this food resilience system. And I feel like, well, based on like the studies that I've read and like my own studies, I feel like opportunities are really important to the people for this bottom-up change. Uh, I don't know if you have any idea or like information on that, because like you said, everything, once the political um, like people like already decided on something, everything can just like change towards, like, you know, like in an instant. And like, not really. <laughs> or like, um, like, what do you feel, especially in Indonesia, if you've been studying here, um, what's the opportunity for people to change on this uh, food resilience system, like to the one that we prefer, the most favorable to this system? Is it difficult still? Well, it, it, I'm not really in a position to say what's, what's most favorite. Um, uh, you know, what is better? Better is a subjective word. Mm -hmm. And this is why it's to do with so psychology, because it's a question of what we each hold in our world view. And there might be somebody who's uh, particularly keen on environmental issues or animal welfare or business opportunity or new uh, GM technology, whatever it is, and that's their drive. How do we balance that set of drives across society? And what you've been studying is where it's at, not what I've been studying. So we need more people like you to help us understand the political ecology of the peace to understand how we then introduce behavioral economics to bring about system change. And the system has a behavior, as well as the individual people. Yeah. And these need to be balanced. Yeah. What do you think about edu education system? Like, is there, because we need to change, uh, like you said, psychological aspects of these people, mm -hmm. especially maybe, it's it's both people, urban and rural areas sure. people, sure. Uh, definitely a different education and psychological um, aspects. But what do you think about that? Should like the rural and the urban people have different education on like this food system, mm -hmm. or like just to just to approach this this thing? Because I feel like not it's in the cities areas like people are starting to get aware that they need to change their diet and they're willing to do that. But they don't know how, for example, and like all the stuff that's in the supermarket is what's available, so that's what they take, what, that's what they eat. Plus, if they're really busy, they're probably just gonna, you know, <laughs> take, take away food, like instant food, microwavable food, and it's not, you know, like it depends on what's on the market. While the people on the rural areas, on the villages, um, they're all just like seeking opportunities on like 
the natural resources that's in front of them. That's what they manage or like what they mm. um, like plant. <laughs> and it's, it's true that climate change really changed everything on that. Like it's changing what they choose to plant too and what they choose to produce. And I don't know, it's a really complex system. I really, I have no idea like on what should we do. It's really complex. You ask about education. Um, I, I mean, there is the notion of formal education, you know, in school and high school and that sort of stuff. But really, I think the, the advent of social media is an extraordinary phenomenon. In, in you know, in the last uh, few years of my lifetime, I'm, I'm now way behind that curve. But there are other people in the room who are on that curve, and they understand the power of that. And so, to bring about a movement, as is, is, an, is using that as an education. I would actually use the word awareness rather than just formal education. Um, and so maybe that's the way forward. Use social media to extend the message to the village, to the town in some way. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Why, why not in the village? Um, you know, everyone's got a phone or a very large number of people have got a phone and they're, they're linked in a way that, you know, 30 years ago one would have said is science fiction. And now it's remarkable. And the sort of job that Dom does the communications is all feeding in through social media to help get this message across. And it doesn't need to be technical. But I think you answered your own question in so much <laughs> as it was a, a series of very sensible comments. Yeah. Well, my name is Angie. I'm from communication team in C4. And well, my question is about social media actually. Um, now, in the age of social media, we can see like even what Beyonce eats, <laughs> what um, top stars eat, and how does it affect like local diets? I mean, Indonesian people can see like what what that people eat, and I just wondering like how it how it um, changed. Well, I'm I'm probably the worst person to ask <laughs> that question to because I don't even know what Beyonce is. But is it? <laughs> but the, the 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 idea is that. Um, you know, having a, what is, I think the word's a meme, is it? Yeah. Uh, how that kind of rolls out across society is fascinating mm -hmm. um, and, and hugely powerful, providing it's rolling out in the right direction. Mm -hmm. But if it's, if it's the wrong message, then it's probably not a good thing. Mm -hmm. So we need to be careful what, what messages are pushed out through, mm -hmm. through this immensely powerful new facility. Okay, um. Yes, we can take, uh, I, I propose we take two more questions and then we, <coughs> two or three, and then we close up. <laughs> it's a great, great chat. But yeah, it's a great chat, so we're not constrained by time. It's just to, um, to keep the overall timing of yeah. one hour and a half. Uh, hi, Yun. Uh, thank you for the time. My name is Yin from SLF. I have a question about uh, the things that you said before about the business that can help. I'm quite curious, uh, from based on your experience, what kind of business that actually can, uh, because you said that it's uh, become uh, also important actors that produce produce something that can be, uh, uh, actually at the end people can eat that. So I, I wonder in your research, what kind of sector or business that actually can have a relationship or work with with uh, with this kind of food system that yeah. already been have a work. Sure. Well, massive, absolutely massive. In the in the UK, where I come from, um, sixteen percent of of of, of uh, the GDP is in the food sector, and sort of one percent is actually in agriculture. Mm -hmm. So it's this value addition and a huge number of jobs. Food processing is the biggest manufacturing industry in in the UK. It dwarfs mm -hmm. aerospace, it dwarfs cars, it dwarfs everything. Hugely important for the economy and it produces good stuff, it produces less good stuff. Um, very much commercially driven and so if one was looking for a top-down approach, one can have regulation. There is regulation on quality, salt, fat, content, that sort of thing. There is no regulation on amount, overall amount, mm -hmm. because that is not something that any government dare touch. Mm -hmm. There's this phrase we use of nanny state, and that this is political death to stand up and say, consume less. Mm -hmm. that's, that's just not going to get anywhere. And so 
managing the quality and managing the quantity are two very different agendas. Mm. The point I was making was essentially one of managing quantity. And I say it's a much tougher challenge because every attempt, whether it was the, um, the, the, the Coke, you know, the bucket Cokes by uh, Bloomberg, whatever it was, bounces back. It just, re society rejects it. So it really tricky stuff. And this is why the, the anthropology, the behavioral um, psychology, behavioral economics is really where it's at. How do we change behavior? Mm. Tough. Yeah, I think it's really interesting because you said about this, not just about education, but also about awareness. Mm. And in one of your slides, that's really interesting when, when you write down about how many, how many amount of price that you pay for each calorie or nutrition that you actually consume. Not so many people are aware of how many calories that they consume uh, instead of the nutrition that they actually can take. Sure. Like how much you're willing to pay for something that is really actually garbage or you want to pay for something that is actually healthy. I never, I mean, I think this is something new for me and also raise my yeah. awareness. Mm -hmm. well, so I just want to point out that thing. But, like, but again, it's, it's a social norm and, and in that the top diagram, uh, the top um, panel, of the last diagram, it had cultural norms as a determinant of food consumption. And um, in many parts of the world, a young chap wants to take his girl out and they go to KFC. Mm -hmm. And this is the place to be yes. seen. Yes, um, yes. You know, occasionally, it's, yeah. not, it's not toxic, mm -hmm. it's just a question of amount. Yes. But it's there, it's heavily promoted, heavily advertised. This business that I was um, just discussing earlier, well, see him right now. The whole business about advertising is, is both the, the, the fact and the emotion working together. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's cool to go to KFC, it's cheap, or whatever, the, yes. whatever you know, you've Affordable got a fact cheap. and you've got an emotion. And so if you translate that into how to bring about societal change, we need to develop both, well, you need advertising skills, basically, to, to present the fact, but then to to, to put it in a basket of emotion. Yeah, thank you. Okay, um, hello, John. Um, my name is Fadri. I went to study to the, in the UK in Imperial College London two years ago, um, but then I've been working on a, a newly established nonprofit from uh, nonprofit organizations with my colleague here. It's called the Joanna Foundation. So TJF is actually working on uh, the, to promote food security through the cultivations of um, suboptimal lands, which is uh, wetlands, lowlands, pitlands. And our main ecosystem that we are currently wor working on is in Riau, in Dragiri Hillier. It was, it's, it, the first time I came here, it was like, I found it very fascinating because uh, the ecosystems are like very, uh, the, the farmers are there and the, the business are also there. And then what we are trying to do now is, um, trying to grow foods on the lands that people might see as a wasteland in a way so that um but then i remember you mentioned in your presentations about how to manage the threat offs so if we want to promote the sustainable agriculture in such lands we're dealing with economically uh, economic and then social and then environmental sustainability and our teams is kind of like really want to believe that it is possible to actually minimize the trade off as minimum as possible but then it's also there's always debate that oh no you can't grow foods there b because you're going to damage the environment but then if you don't grow food there we're going to run we are running out of lands in the urban areas to grow food so things like that that um i want you to more elaborate on how do we actually can manage the trade offs well you know between the three sectors that is like the triangle of that like how do we smack in the middle you know yeah let's get that well, oh, goodness, um, how to manage trade-offs. Well, first of all, make sure you know what you're talking about in terms of what are the things you are trying to trade. Um, any intervention will have, have winners and losers. Um, often the loser um, could be environment. Um, the winner might be a local enterprise. So, the, you know, how, how, do you, how do you balance these two currencies, which are very different currencies? And this again, where it goes into, into um, your sort of world view. Um, how, how much value do you put on soil loss or 
a, a muddy river or something like that. So you you know you need to work out that sort of thing. But the 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 main thing is to is to be clear what your conceptual framework is that you're working in, and to have a boundary. You can't include everything, but you know that the boundary is there. You know that some things are outside the boundary because they're just too difficult or they're something you don't have the skill in, but at least you recognize them and then you need to think about the consequence of leaving that outside your conceptual framework. And that's really how you do trade-off analysis because you first of all agree what you're trying to trade and then you have the conceptual framework and decide what's within your discussion and what's outside your discussion. Okay, we are also developing our framework now, so that is a very good suggestion mm. on like trade of well, analysis. Think of, yeah, think about boundaries. The boundaries, yeah. keywords, boundaries. Okay, mm. thank you. That's it. Thank you. Any any other last question? Um, okay, one last one before we close. Um, so advertising companies or um, major food companies such as for example coca-cola they're always hailed as the, <laughs> as the poster boy bad child but um they've been criticized for dishonest advertising and tapping into um the kind of addiction areas of our brain um, and preying on our uh, uh impulses our caveman impulses if you like um, and i was just wondering if bad foods should be allowed to run advertising campaigns. Can I please ask everybody in the room who thinks bad food should be allowed to have advertising? Put their hand up. So, so what to do? What to do? Um, again, it goes back to who are the winners and losers. The winners might be public health, the losers would be the McDonald truck driver out of a job like that. Mm -hmm. So again, it's this huge, this huge balance. It's, it's, it's really, really difficult. I mean, it's glib to say it's really difficult, but it is really difficult because of vested interests. I don't know how everyone's, if everybody has a pension, where that pension money is being invested. Is it ethically invested? You've really got to dig deep to find out mm. where your own personal life is, 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 is engaged with you know, the, the good and the bad. It's really, it's really mm. difficult. There's so much kind of fog out there. And there are areas of society I know nothing about, like pension finance, I don't know anything about that. I'm just aware that mm. pension houses or you know, big, big uh, investment houses is where the, where the real power is. And if we, if we want to bring about a change in, in a corporate, you don't talk to the corporate, you talk to the investors who are investing in that corporate. Unfortunately, it is in the best interest of pension funds of the world that we don't eat healthy food. And a recent study from the so-called Rotterdam Nutrition Study showed healthier food is about eight years longer healthy lives. Well, what is the problem of pension funds these days that people live too long and they retire early and we don't have enough money to pay them? So it is in their very best interest that we don't eat healthy food. That's the only way pension funds can work. Yes, uh, but perhaps that's not what we really want to aim at uh, in, the, in the research we, we do. Um, so, um, thank, thank you, for uh, uh, John, for... Uh, this uh, very interesting uh, presentation that triggered a very interesting debate. Uh, I think uh, these are also very interesting questions for us in a research program that, okay, is focused on forestries, agroforestry, landscapes, already a very wide agenda, but okay, what can we tell? Uh, or what can we bring to systemic issues that are much, much wider than this? Uh, do we think, first, there is the recognition that the food system is a system and is very complex. And the question for us is whether we let that steam train just move on because it's going, it's just too complex and it's too massive. It's perhaps even as complex as climate change itself or all these, you know, earth system processes. Or do we try to figure out what 
could be the key interventions uh, in our uh, in our way or uh, in our in our domains that could help the food system move towards more sustainability and to provide better or healthier diets and and we believe that uh, some of the levels uh, we we can uh, in, especially in some of the countries where there is I don't very really much like the term but where there is a win-win in terms of developing uh, new value chains out of three products uh, nuts. Um, the, the, the Eat Lancet Commission just recommended that the world population doubles uh, the amount of nuts in, in their diets. Okay, uh, that has a huge, that would have a huge implication on agroforestry, on forests, on tree based systems. Uh, the same thing with fruits, uh, it also needs to be doubled. Uh, what can we do? How can the value chains be organized? Uh, how do we deal with fresh fruits or with, tr with transformation that can bring a lot of jobs, etc., etc.? Listening to these presentations, my closing words would be that we are at a crossroads in the world food system. We must not forget the challenge of the triple burden of malnutrition facing us today, also accompany associated issues contributing to the degradation of natural capital from not only climate change but also from overexploitation and other forms of abuse, contributing to exceeding planetary boundaries. This is a clear message and we cannot continue our current trajectory of, of consuming too little, too much or the wrong types of food at an unsustainable cost to natural resources, the environment and the health. We must change the course. To address this, we of course need to look at all aspects relevant for food and nutritional security and that involves food and non-food systems, which actually means dealing with complexity and working in an integrated manner so that proposed solutions are fit for both the problem they address and the main objective being pursued for the system addressing food and nutritional security as a whole. But moving from theory to practice on concepts of systems approach is however not simple. Productivity, profitability, flexibility, adaptability, gender responsiveness, and resilience are just some of the aspects that characterize systems. This, of course, all complicated by the fact that recommendations or interventions made will not be context specific. There really isn't going to be one size that fits all. So my question, question is, are we really clear to which boundaries should be considered? Under what conditions? It tells me that a deeper understanding is needed by the science community to guide policy makers and others ch and other change implementers to reverse these global challenges. Well, in the case of our program, Forestries and Agroforestry, research is based on the premise that attention through policy and practice to under-recognized contribution of forest landscape mosaics, agroforestry practices, and specific forest and tree-based foods in supporting nutritional diversity and human health will provide important contributions to rural and urban communities. Concurrently, we also seek ways to, to protect soils and water, restore degraded ecosystems, and more sustainably manage them for increased resilience of those systems and the communities that depend on them. As diets are changing, there is also a need for greater understanding of the biological, economic, physical, social, physiological determinants of choice and the attitudes, the beliefs, and the knowledge that surrounds food consumption. More research is definitely required on what drives food choice motives for healthier foods, including those derived from trees. In lower income countries, where very little is known uh, and documented. So um, um, a big research agenda that we want to develop. We'll take home some of the lessons of the discussions points uh, here today. We'll discuss with our teams, uh, Ramni uh, uh, at eCraft, uh, Amy uh, at C4, and, at, and, and colleagues at Biodiversity and, and, and other in, the, in FTA. Uh, and we very much look forward to continue to hopefully uh, continue work with with John and, and, and with Oxford, with the Environmental Change Institute and your, your food systems program in the future because we uh, we believe that between uh, landscapes, markets and, and you know better nutrition and better food systems, we there, there are lots of things we, we, we can contribute.